Let's see, we're gonna talk about the war on whites a little bit. I, I wonder I wonder if you're allowed to talk about they thought that maybe like if you named a music video or a music um, music, I mean a YouTube video War on Whites if you're gonna get blocked. But I think that my channel is pretty much shadow blocked. Um, I don't know who who hasn't subscribed to it already um, ever see is ever gonna get to see it I don't I, I don't know how um, far my channel goes these days but at any rate um, in terms of being promoted it's not it's not as okay so um, I want to read a few things talk about um, the war on whites and um, who's behind it and um, some of their tactics. Now I saw this in the New York Times. Um, scoring points with fans for hating fascists. Okay, I wrote a little note there that says uh, no room for hate. <laughs> yeah, right? So these are, right, these are the same people that always talk about like there's no room for hate, you know? But they don't have a problem of you know hating a fascist and um, first of all I got to defend fascists because um, as far as I can understand fascism is just people who want to have a sovereign nation that's um, unharassed by the um, control freaks at the top of the pyramid and so they you know come up with these control words, you know, like Nazi and fascist and, and, and so forth, uh, racist, um, xenophobe, they, they come up with these words to try to um, shut the conversation down or control the conversation, just, you know, shut people up. Um, so I want to, later on, I'll get into talking about racism um, as um, it's uh, not... Uh, jurisdiction of the government it's not that the government should have nothing to do with with um, fighting racism it's not their job that's between people and God it's not government's job <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, I'll talk about that later let's I want to first start with this scoring points with fans for hating fascism they have a well, I'll read what it says here a little bit I'm not gonna read a lot of it it's um, goes on and on but um, let's see there are the Orlando solar solar bears hockey game on ESPN but what, what draws I'm, I'm continuing from page one which I probably don't have but, or do I let me see if I have page one I don't think I have page one I, I think that I just have yeah it just starts up right here anyway uh, what draws Mr. Um, Parin, Parinye and the rest of the supporters uh, here for uh, is the team's unusual politics. So, okay, so this is basically what they what it is is um, I think they call the pirates, and it's a um, oh no, they're, they're, they're this uh, Saint Pauli, Saint Pauli. Is it uh, St. Pally? Oh, that's the team, the St. Pally team. I don't know, maybe they are called the Pirates. But anyway, okay, so <clears throat> uh, FC St. Pally um, is an avowed anti fascist soccer team based in Hamburg that plays in Germany's second division and hasn't won uh, the title in more than 40 years. Though it runs a, a kindergarten inside the stadium which displays signs proclaiming, no person is illegal. The, uh, the club has a fervent international fandom that defines itself in opposition to racism and violence that characterizes European football hooliganism. So, um, so basically this is a contrived football team. Um, and so what the New World Order uh, control freaks do is they, they they invent things like um, contexts in order to spread their message. Like, okay, soccer fans. They say, 
spread the message through this contrived football team. That, now, I, I, I thought this was very interesting. Um, they have this display that says, no person is illegal. Well, does that mean fascists for them are not illegal? Or are they, when they say no person is illegal, they're lying? Is this more deception? Is this the usual dose of deception? You know, that, that's, that you get from these people. Is, um, see, that's what Jesus called them liars and murderers from the beginning, because they lie about things, and if you don't believe their lies, they'll kill you one way or the other. They'll eventually, um, they either kill you as an individual or they'll um, actually start a war and kill you know, millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, just because um, you're not believing their lies. Um, Okay, so now here's another one, the same thing. This was in, in another paper, uh, it was an article um, that was in the local Trenton paper. Um, okay, it's probably, oh, it's Associated Press. Okay, so it's not really, you know, it didn't originate Trenton. It's uh, Associated Press. Facebook extends ban on hate speech to white nationalists. Okay, um, Facebook extended its ban on hate speech to prohibit the promotion and support of white nationalism and white separatism. Wow. So, <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. So, um, so if you want to have, uh, so, okay, so why not, um, uh, Japanese, why, why isn't why isn't wanting uh, the uh, Japanese uh, nation to be Japanese? Why they, that? Why is not that hate? You know? Why are they singling out white white nationalists? Um, what if you know there was a nation in Africa that wanted to um, uh, perpetuate um, the black African um, people and culture? Uh, would that be hate? Hate? What's the guy called hate? Well, the the whole thing about okay, the whole thing about hate, um, having um, hate laws, for instance, is it's not the government's jurisdiction to um, be meddling in what what you know what takes place in in your heart. Um, uh, you know, some people have commented that it's. You know, a law against emo a particular emotion. Um, that's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, so, the hate speech thing is just simply a way of selectively persecuting certain people. Now, the, the I think the common um, assessment is that the reason that they are after whites particularly is that um, white people are more likely not to go along with the, the New World Order plan, uh, especially these days. I mean, I'm, I'm more of a um, Christian separatist, but I absolutely have nothing against anybody who wants to be a white nationalist or a white separatist, especially separatism. Separatism is an important thing. God invented the whole idea of having separate nations so these, you know, these people that are trying to abolish separate nations are actually going against God. They're, they're building. I had just um, commented on um, uh, a red ice um, Lena's uh, red ice commentary um, um, that um, gee, you know, the, if if you're Here's what happened. Okay, here's what happens. This is going to tie into later on when I when I talk about this guy wrote this article about Kate Smith, the whole Kate Smith thing. Christians have been led to believe that the, that it's a moral obligation, it's morally correct to allow anybody and everybody into the nation, and that's not a really Christian value. That the, the Christian value is to allow people the freedom to associate or disassociate or include or exclude whomever they wish. That's really the Christian moral correct way of approaching civilization. If you 
are going to, if you're a Christian and you agree with this idea of um, allowing anybody and anybody in, into a nation like that, is you're really building the mystery Babylon. And as Christians, we're not supposed to be building Babylon. I mean, as Jesus um, and God, um, remember, destroyed the Tower of Babel originally because of this um, humanitarian, uh, humanist, not humanitarian, humanist unity that um, put, makes man um, God and replaces God, you know, God with man. And, and um, uh, God's idea was to split it up and have these different nations and different languages. That was the, the um, origin of um, uh, multiplicity of languages that separate people because they couldn't understand each other. They, they had to separate. This was God. This is the God of the Bible, the Old Testament, that, that, that um, is such a hard sell for uh, the uh, Red Ice crowd. But let's. I'm going to read the, more of this article about the Facebook. Uh, the company has uh, previously allowed some, such material even as uh, is it had long banned white supremacists. Okay, so, so they're going from supremacists down now to nationalists and separatists. Let's see. Um, the social network said on Wednesday that it, it didn't apply the ban previously to expressions of white nationalism because it linked such expressions with broader concepts of nationalism and separatism, such as American pride or Bosque separation which are still allowed. Okay, so the Bosque's still allowed. <laughs> um, it's so selective. So uh, that's the nice thing about hate. You know, if you're going to persecute people for hate, you just, you know, you just, you know, whoever you hate, you, you know, pin that word on them and accuse them of hate speech. And it allows you to hate whoever you want and look like you're an anti-hater. It's just like that, that thing I was reading about the soccer team. They, 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 um, they, they're the anti-haters that hate fascist, <laughs> and they put it right in writing. I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine? This is New York Times. Could you imagine? Yeah, New York Times. Anybody else promoting hating? But they're allowed to promote hate. That, that's that's that they're, because they're the ones that decide who who you who you should hate and who you shouldn't. So, you know, you got. <laughs> um, let's see. But civil rights groups and academics called this view misguided and have long pressured the company to change its stance. I always like how they blame like other groups, even though you know this is something they they've been wanting wanting to do for the longest time. And so, what they do when they finally decide to do it, they say, "Oh, other people pressured us to do it." That's that's uh, fake as fake as uh, it can be. Um, okay, so they pressured the company to change its stance. Facebook said it. Concluded after months of conversations <laughs> with the white nas with them that white nationalism and separatism cannot be meaningfully separated from white supremacy and organized hate groups. Wow, I bet they had to really struggle with that one. Woo boy! Critics have uh, raised these issues uh, to the highest level at Facebook and held a number of working meetings with their staff as we've tried to get them to the right place, <laughs> said Kristen Clark, President Kristen Clark, President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under law, a Washington DC based legal advocacy group. So they had the they they own the advocacy groups to tell the advocacy groups what, what what to tell them so that they can make it look like the advocacy groups are really steering the ship. <laughs> um, this is long overdue as the uh, country continues to deal with the grip of hate and the increase of violent white supremacy. And really, is it violent white supremacy? I didn't know about that. I thought that the, all the violence was caused by the Antifa and the and Black Lives Matter. But no, it's the way. <laughs> where that you know they're just making up the story. It's like there's nothing. There's nothing behind it. They, uh, they occasionally they'll have a false flag. That they've organized to try to, you know, try to give it some credibility. We need a tech sector, tech sector to do the part to combat the efforts. Though Facebook Incorporated said it has been working on the change for three months, it comes less than two weeks after Facebook received widespread criticism after the suspect in the shootings at the two New, or New, Ze uh, New Zealand mosques killed 50 people was able to broadcast massacre on video on Facebook. 
Also Wednesday, a man convicted on state murder charges in a deadly car attack at a white nationalist rally in Charlottesville, which seemed awful staged. It's, 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 <laughs> that, that, that whole thing was um, trumped up. You know, we, we, we need a bad incident to happen so we can uh, characterize the whole thing as, as, as you know, violent. Uh, bloodshed, they call it. Bloodshed. <laughs> okay. But uh, now Facebook is trying to do more. As a part of Wednesday's change. People who search for terms associated with white supremacy on Facebook will be directed to a group called Life After Hate. Really? Hey, you know what? Why don't they introduce the New York Times Life After Hate? They... they that they, that's apparently <laughs> how about how about why don't they introduce New York Times and Life After Hate? All right, uh, that's that's great. They come up with these. Uh, this is what has. <laughs> so, all right, let me see. Um, okay, let's see. Okay, uh, Clark uh, called the idea that white supremacism is different than white nationalism. Um, or white separatism and misguided distinction without differences. She said the New Zealand attack was a powerful reminder about why we need a tech sector to do more to stamp out the conduct of, and activity of violent white supremacists. Well, I blame um, the incidents in uh, the Christchurch, New Zealand shootings um, as much on uh, the guy who did the shooting as they do on. Uh, um, George Soros Open Society and the, uh, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, um, they're the ones that are orchestrating this um, uh, destruction of Western culture. And basically what they're saying is if you fight back, you know, we will blame you. You will be, you know, um, you're the perpetrator because you're fighting back. Um, Rashad Robinson, the president of Color of Change, says a uh, racial justice group warned Facebook to the dangers of white nationalists on its platform years ago, and he was glad to see Wednesday's announcements. Facebook's update should move Twitter, YouTube, and Amazon to act urgently to stem the growth of white nationalist ideology which finds space on platforms to spread the violent ideas and rhetoric that inspired the tragic attacks witnessed in Charlotte, Pittsburgh, and Christchurch, she said. Twitter does not currently ban white nationalists or white separatists, though its hateful conduct policy forbids the promotion of violence or threats against people on the basis of race, gender, religion, and other protected categories. It also bans the use of hateful images or symbols. <laughs> and um, and uh, profile or header images. YouTube also bans hate speech and says it removes content promoting violence or hatred on the basis of these categories. Amazon has an offensive products policy that does not allow the promotion or glorification of hatred, racial violence, or sexual or religious intolerance. The three companies did not immediately respond to messages for comments on Wednesday. Madahi Ahusain, a special counsel for anti-Muslim bigotry at the nonprofit Muslim Advocates, said what's needed now is more information on how Facebook will define white nationalist content and how it will enforce its new rule. Now, you know, it's interesting. I, I guess it was like national public radio. They even have international public radios. But their big scare was oh, in New Zealand, you know, um, better watch out. You know, Muslims better be careful. They're going to get attacked. I, I thought that the, I thought that, um, uh, that was right. I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. Not in New Zealand. In um, in uh, um, where was those those church bombings? Um, Sri Lanka. Okay. So then that's right. Sri Lanka. The Muslims in Sri Lanka. They got to be careful because you know they're, they're under they're being persecuted. <laughs> you know, this is how they do it. They they'll um, do some kind of terrorist attack, and, and then and then and then the, the um, 
New World Order newspapers will come in and say, you know, watch out for, um, you know, the non-Muslims are going to attack the Muslims. And the, the event turns into, it was, a, you know, it turns into like in the newspapers if it was actually an anti-Muslim thing all along. Okay, uh, now the question is how will Facebook interpret and enforce the new policy to prevent another tragedy like Christchurch mosque attacks, you said. So, um, see, that's how they're doing it. Any, anybody who fights back, uh, you're not allowed to fight back. You're not allowed to talk. See, so here's the thing. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to conduct a rhetorical war. They're not going to let you re conduct a rhetorical war. And so somebody like this guy that shot up in Christchurch um, knows that, that he, he's not allowed to speak. He's, he's, he's left down, his options have been limited just to violence. But that's, a, that's what they left him with. You know, I don't, you know, it's hard to blame him for, for, for um, you know, here's what happens. He sees, he sees that they're orchestrating um, the death of his people uh, through this, um, you know, Islamic takeover. And he is not allowed to talk about it. They just said that they're not going to let him talk about it. So now, what's he, what's he left with? You know. Uh, okay. So this is interesting. This was um, this is a guy who writes for the Bucks County Courier Times, um, J. D. Mullane. Okay, and um, he's like he's a conservative, maybe like. Um, He's an ill-informed conservative, let's put it that way. He's very articulate, but he um, still has a lot to learn about um, the deception of the Matrix and so forth. Um, but he wrote this article about Kate Smith being banned. I don't know if you heard about that, but a long, long time ago, she sung a couple songs that... Uh, were less than flattering. Um, you know, nothing like um, gangster rap. It wasn't like she was singing gangster rap. <laughs> it wasn't like, you know, nigga this and nigga that. It wasn't gangster rap. It was just like pop songs. Easy Boomer, let me explain why Kate Smith has been disappeared. First, she's been tagged a racist. There is no appeal, lawsuit, or boycott that reverse this verdict. Stick a fork in Kate Smith, she's done, vanished. Down the cultural memory hole, her reputation is irreparable, disfigured her. God bless America, now uh, now freighted with baggage that from now on, anyone who plays it will be considered a, a racist simp. It doesn't matter how many millions Kate Smith raised on the home front to beat the Nazis who were actually racist uh, or to defeat Imperial Japan in World War II. It doesn't matter if she raised millions for the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts over her lifetime, donating the money she earned from God Bless America to these organizations. Okay, of course, you know I'm going to comment on his, his lack of education about World War II. Um, the um, uh, and Nazis um, were on the right side of the, of the, of the war and that um, General Patton was correct. We fought, we fought on the wrong side of the war. Um, you, have, you have to hear what General Patton says about that. Um, this is why, you see, this is because we, because we defeated the Nazis, that's why now America is basically a communist country that, that does this kind of stuff, you know. Um, bans people, uh, uh, totally um, disappears people because um, once upon a time, you know, they, they, they wore a black face or something like that. You know, that's why we're here, we, we are where we are because we, we um, fought against the Nazis instead of for them. That's what happened because um, the, the, the Nazis were not really interested in you know, Adolf Hitler was a Zionist. He was helping the Jews to um, establish Israel. Um, but um, since he got rid of their banks and he wasn't under their control, 
they started World War II. They hired um, Winston Churchill to uh, bomb, firebomb men, women, and children. And by the end of the war, they had Eisenhower starving to death um, a million surrendered soldiers. Um, and we um, just went down the path of communism. So <laughs> General Patton was right. We should have fought with the Nazis to, to, to defeat the uh, Bolshevik communists. So that's the, that's, you know, to me, that's the big mistake, one of the big mistakes in America. Uh, um, there's many big mistakes that Americans made, but probably the biggest was World War II. World War I was also a very big one. Um, uh, and the Civil War was also a very big one. And the um, Union of the States was a very big mistake. So that, I would say, you know, if I'm going to, the, the biggest mistakes of, of Amer America, number one was uniting the, uniting the colonies into one humanist government because at the time they had freedom to even have a theocracy or whatever they wanted to have. And they lost the freedom of self-governance uh, to the sly uh, humanist control freaks who started the New World Order pretty much in the United States is the original New World Order. Okay, then we, so then we had, of course, the Civil War, which um, the South should have won that. Um, it wasn't really about slavery. The slavery would have, was on the way out anyways. Um, then, of course, we got in the wrong side of World War One. Uh, Henry Ford tried to stop that. He, his efforts were thwarted by the international bankers. Uh, then we uh, took the wrong side in World War Two. And um, and then of course we were full <laughs> in full 9/11. 9/11. If you scratch, look under the surface. You don't have to dig too deep. You don't have to be a rocket scientist or anything. You look under the uh, you know scratch the surface. You see that. It was Israeli and, and Jewish Americans that, that orchestrated 9-11, the destruction of the towers um, that were owned by Larry, Larry Silverstein. And um, you, there's just, you gotta get, read the book uh, by um, Christopher Boland, uh, Solving 9-11. I, I read most of the book on my channel um, uh, to uh, alert people to this fact that, um, Israelis and American Jews did 9-11. And <clears throat> I'm a Christian Zionist. And Christians um, need to believe in God, that God always had a problem with the Jews when they did something evil. He never said they get a free pass <laughs> because they're, they're Jewish. He never gave them a free pass. Okay, so... Um, the immutable verdict was handed down last week by a faceless, shadowy force we'll call the culture. It learned that 80 years ago, America's sweetheart recorded two songs with racist language and also pitched for a toy called the Mammy Doll, based on a character, character of a black woman. The New York Yankees, who've played Smith's God Bless America during the seventh inning, stretch since 9-11 pulled it um, as it uh, s uh, pulled it and said Kate as well uh, Kate will never be heard again I'm sorry okay so they they um, are not gonna play Kate Smith anymore Philadelphia Flyers who adopted Smith as their good luck charm when she belted out the tune at the game in the lo long ago uh, 1970s did, this, uh, did the same next day, but the Flyers went one better. They first draped the black a statue of the uh, Rubenesque Smith, which stood outside the South Philly venue where the team plays home games. Then they yanked it from the ground and placed it in an undisclosed location. Instantly, an American icon whose song rallied this country in Great Depression, World War II, and Dark Days of September 11th, 2001 is uh, today a cultural leper. Uh, for startled boomers, this is a swift and stunning turn. Their childhoods belting out tunes on the Ed Sullivan show 
in Philadelphia. She's truly beloved, remembered for her appearances at the Flyers games and Stanley Cup era. Boomers who love Kate Smith can't seem to mount a convincing defense. Maybe there isn't one. Maybe they don't want to risk the tag racist. The Twitter ma would descend, hound pound, and tweet your boss and colleagues. Best keep you quiet. How did this happen, Boomer? Simply. Okay, now, and before I go into his, his reasoning, uh, I mean, he's right. This is, a, this is what happens. You know, they, they, they have these words. They have these control words that can actually um, ruin your life. <laughs> you know, one word. So that's why I'm on a campaign um, to um, help people be more understanding of racism, that it's, uh, for the most part, I would say, you know, most, most of it is not, uh, it comes to some kind of random act of hate. It's been, it's been generated by some kind of events in the past. Something happened, some kind of event in, the, in their life has colored people's thinking about certain other people groups and so forth, and, you know, that's a, that's a natural thing to do, and um, people should give one another the space to do that. You should be gracious. You know, that's what Jesus taught, be graceful. I go around condemning people for <laughs> every little thing. Gee whiz, you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, how, you know, where is the love? Where is, where is the grace? Where's the forgiveness? You know, they, they, these, these um, people that like to destroy lives, um, are always complaining about Christians being unforgiving. <laughs> There's the same people that say, you know, Christians are so unforgiving. Now, here I'm a Christian, and I'm, and I'm saying, look, you people, you got to lighten up and be graceful. And let people have a little wiggle room to be, to be you know, uh, charged up with, with, with a certain amount of hate. That's just a natural part of life. You know, I'm, I'm, and I'm not promoting, I'm not saying, look, you know, let's... Um, it's, you know, let's cultivate hate. I'm not talking about cultivate. I'm just saying, you know, the haters are the people that would try to get you fired because they, they decided for some reason you're a racist. They're the hate. The haters are the ones that did this to Kate Smith. They're the haters. You know, that that's, you know, that's a simple fact. You, you know, the, the, I, you know, as a Christian, am very easy going, you know. Um, you have um, a racist attitude. Well, maybe something happened in your life that that, that, that caused you to do that. I'm not gonna try to ruin your life. You know why? Why? Why are people so un, unforgiving and so, so ungrateful? Why are they so ungracious? You know, where's the love? Where's the love? If people would do so, you know, like this. I don't get it. I don't. I don't see why. Why are why are we preaching? Why, why are people preaching against the Christians being unloving when when they, when they they could they could just decide they're going to ruin somebody's life because of one little event somewhere that that, that really is not um, a threat to anybody or anything for any reason. Um, uh, but they're the ones that are threatening people. They're the ones that are constantly threatening people. The, you know the the social justice war. Warriors are the hate-filled destroyers, you know? <laughs> and so that's why you know. Look, look, look. Let's let's call people anti-racists or haters, anti-anti-fascists or haters, anti-anti-anti-Nazis um, uh, um, uh, or, or haters, and um, you know. Let's get. Let's try to build a different culture. See, he's saying, well, okay, this is the call. He's going to blame it on the culture, okay. But what he doesn't do, he, he, he does a little bit. He touches on, let me read it, and I'll, I'll show you, because he does touch a little bit on the communist influence on the culture. Okay, so how, does this, how did this happen, Boomer? Simple. You don't control the culture anymore. Your kids, millennials, mostly control it. Their generation doesn't like you, your values, your beloved icons. As you, as you rejected your parents' ideas about marriage, sex, fun weed, millennials reject your values that America would be 
a swell place if everyone would just work hard and shut up about white privilege and racism. Millennials hate that. They probably, they're probably eager to reveal other f fatal faults of your heroes and put them in the cultural dungeon. How did this happen? Maybe it was college and the myriad of tenured crackpots who teach in humanities departments. Uh, they had your kids read Chomsky and Zinn, turn them against the middle class values you spent 18 years in stealing. Maybe it's the lingering resentment about divorce boomer or late anger about how you um, pressured them into college, which you sold as the only path to success. A move that left them struggling with debt and bitter about the American dream. Maybe it was your effort to not push religion on them and let them decide for themselves. Well, they've decided, and the religion they've chosen is green secular progressivism. I might add communism or Bolshevism. Perhaps you thought they'd stop tearing things down after they yanked statues of Confederate generals who fought for the preservation of slavery. What well, they didn't fight for the preservation of slavery. The guy doesn't see this as mean. He's got too much bad information. If he got some good information, he could really tear this up because he's, he's very articulate. Um, if it feels good to tick off the old timers, remember Rizzo came next, then Columbus, now Kate Smith, that's the low-hanging fruit. Wait until they discover th through Vox or some social media meme that um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, what Theodore Roosevelt said about immigrants who don't assimilate, or Lincoln's racist jokes, or that George Washington owned slaves, or that Jefferson may have had kids with his slave servant. Hell, they'd be um, lobbing mortars at Mount Rushmore, an anti-racist uh, um, rage. They are the outer bands of an incoming storm as the country commences to tear itself apart over its history. It's the beginning of a long dark night that boomers who came of age with its morning in America simply won't understand. The torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans and they intend to use it. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, that is uh, interesting because um, Lena, Lena, I'll call her Lena Pomgan. Lena, like, because she didn't take her husband's last name. At <laughs> um, any rate, um, she just made that video saying that she also uh, senses that. Um, uh, bad times or dark times are coming. I, I, um, I think that if we get the information out, you know, if we get enough information out quick enough, I don't think the, I, I think that this article I just read here is about Kate Smith by, uh, is a, a J.D. Mullane, um, is a little too negative about the generations coming. It's, it's not all of them. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of the younger generation, I think, that's um, uh, has exposure to the alternative information from the Internet that um, could stem this, this, the tide, you know, this, um, this uh, I don't know, it seems like some kind of war is brewing. I know that... Um, the powers that be, you know, the people that did 9-11 and own our government, um, <laughs> they um, were trying, you know, they're kicking around ideas. They, they're kicking around, let's try to, you know, let's get a word going with Russia, for instance. And, you know, my, my attitude is, well, look, Russia's less communist than we are. I mean, I, I, you know, you don't want to start that war because if most Americans are like me, we'll be fighting for the Russians. You know, I mean, that's the that's that simple. I mean, that's that's the is the best thing to do at that point. Um, I don't know, but the, I don't think the Chinese, you know, the, the, the Chinese blended with America so much. It's it's kind of hard to get a war going between. They're almost like, I mean, you know, they don't want to kill all their customers. They have to sell their their trinkets to us. 
you know, I don't think that's going to work either. Um, Iran, um, it seems like most Americans also, you know, they feel that nothing's wrong with Iran. They're, not, they're good people. Um, they they um, it's never attacked us or anything like that. They, you know, they're, they're um, you know, they can't seem to, they can't seem to come up with um, a viable war candidate. You know that the the, the uh, you know, American people, um, I think, realize that the military-industrial complex is really just a machine that um, is into doing the dirty work for the for the new world order trillionaire you know international bankers who want to consolidate power you know um, and you know do you really want to is that why you're gonna put your life at risk for the to help these guys consolidate power and and you know f finally put an end to uh, what you thought <laughs> what you thought was um, the Western world um, you know that that's a, that's a shame about the you know first and second war, world wars. I mean that that, that we were we weren't fighting for the American people or freedom or the, anything like that. All we were, all we, all those guys were doing, and they didn't know that. I mean I'm not I'm not putting it down. These the, you know these guys that that gave their lives in there and, 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 and you know lost limbs and whatever they did. Um, they thought they were doing the right thing. They had no idea that they were just um, perpetuating. The their own slavery, the the the, the, the coming generations, <laughs> they were just actually helping to um, the tighten the noose on the coming generations. That they were helping the control freaks that um, are eventually going to put their grandchildren in um, harm's way, um, one way or another. Uh, did they think that they were doing that? I don't think so. You know, that, um, it's just that um, you need the information. And you need to be willing to listen to people like General Patton. You know, you just don't listen to what the media says. Look, look at look at the crazy things. Okay, they said they said about him. He says, okay, look, we got oh, we got all these great uh, German soldiers here, and we can go and finish the job off. You know, Moscow, Saint Petersburg, and and um, uh, what have you. You know, um, um, go and finish off the communists. And they, the, the thing that they said, that, that, you know, to, to try to make it sound, you know, to make, to fool the people, to deceive the people, was, oh, this guy's crazy. I mean, the last thing you want to do is start another war. <laughs> That's all they do is start war. They love wars. It's just not their war. They got to do a war they control. That's not the war they wanted. They didn't want, they don't want to, they didn't want to get rid of the communists. They're, they were they're turning the world into, into um, a whole communist system. That they, they, they didn't want, they weren't going to. They weren't going to do that. That's what that, the whole thing about that whole uh, all the anti-communist rhetoric that that I grew up with was really just a, a a ploy, a decoy to make it sound like they're really anti-communist. You know, the State Department's really anti-communist when really, in fact, you know, it's a typical thing. It's a typical thing that these people do. Um, they blame. They accuse somebody else of doing the same thing that they're doing. I, I, I watched a, a video recently. One of these, um, you know, heavily promoted, New World Order funded, fake YouTube channels with some guy um, saying um, that white people want to be on top of the pyramid, and it was <laughs> all about white people wanting to be on top of the pyramid. And I had, and I had um, commented. I said, "Well, that's interesting. Notice he, he didn't say the white people can't be on top of the pyramid because the Jews are already there. He didn't say that, because that's that's the that's how they do it. They they accuse you of doing the very thing that they're doing. You know, was, uh, you know. So if if they're accusing you, if they're saying your desire to be on want to be on the top of the pyramid. By the way, that's not what white people want. But your desire to be on top of the pyramid is evil." And so you think, well, surely, surely, if they if they're condemning that, then they they have no interest in being on top of the pyramid. Well, they're there already. You know, what I mean? it's like, <clears throat> all right. So now this is interesting. This is um, this is from the Fen F Friends of Israel magazine. Huh? Um, you can consider me a friend of Israel. I'm, I'm 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 like I said, I'm a Christian Zionist, but I I believe that the Jews 
the Israelis who are conducting the war on whites, and it did 9-11, and started World War II, and started World War I, they have to pay for their sins. That's what God's, that's how, if you read the Bible, that's, that's what the Bible's all about. It's okay, okay, you know, the Israelis have done this, now they have to pay for their sins. You know, God sent Assyria on them, and Babylon on them, and uh, all kinds of different people get sick on them because they're doing evil things. The Bible even condemns it from the exact same things they're doing now of um, promoting, you know, the Hollywood culture for, you know, promoting all this evil. And the Bible says, you know, not only have you done this evil, but you caused others to do more evil than, you know, than even yourself and so forth. So the, the um, see, this is where, where one of these days I got to do this, uh, alt-right Bible, the thing, you know, and, and it kind of, I want to kind of expose the um, red ice crowd to the, how much Bible has in common with their, their thinking about, look, you know, we don't let people get away with murder and do evil things. I mean, God, you know, that's the, the, so much of the content of the Bible is God sending these prophets to get, condemn the Israelis for promoting sinful activity. And, and um, doing harmful things to other people. Okay, so <clears throat> this article says, have you ever wondered, and I'll show you, there's the, um, here's the cover, is, Israel, oh, there's Israel My Glory magazine, that's what it was, I think it's made by Friends of Israel. Okay. Have you ever wondered why the Jewish people have been scattered throughout the the nations of the world more consistently than any other people? Why anti-Semitism persists in rearing its ugly head repeatedly throughout history? Why Nazism specifically targeted the Jewish people for genocide in the Holocaust of World War II? Why the Jews have endured, uh, why the Jews have endured despite all of their persecutions? Why they uh, tenaciously hold on to the land they presently occupy in the Middle East, why the modern state of Israel, despite its small size, repeated the focus of world attention. And uh, yes, I have worried, worried, wondered about these things, and I looked into them. And well, we know that you know God had um, scattered the Jewish people throughout the nations um, at 70 A.D. with the Romans conquering Israel. Okay, that the the um, the land that they so tenaciously hold on to these days. Um, why anti-Semitism persists? Well, it's because look what the look what the Jews are doing. They come into a nation, they take over, they 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 go to the top, they control it. You know, they 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 take, they, they print the money. You work five months out of the year to to, to empower. You know, to enrich them. The, you know, I'm talking about the Rothschilds and those people that are on the top of the pyramid. I'm not talking about, you know, the average Jew that lives down the street. Um, <clears throat> and then the people get pissed off, of course. Oh, and the other thing they do is, and then they invite all kinds of um, uh, foreigners and Muslims into your land to to, um, to destroy you when they're done with you. You know, they're, they're done now. They, they, they've used you up. We'll bring the Muslims in and, and, and um, you know... <laughs> yeah, give them that fight. And, you know, it happened in Spain, and and and, and uh, it took the Spanish seven hundred years to to get to get rid of the Muslims after the Jews let them in. And now they're doing this in in, in Europe, big time. And America is the you know the, the American military is being used to um, conduct these wars and 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 destroy these Middle Eastern countries so that these people will have you know are, are motivated to to go to places like Europe and New Zealand. And they'd like to do that in America. It's going to be a little bit harder. We have so many guns in America. You know, that's the saving grace. There's a God bless America. That's that's how we did it. Okay, so. Um, why not seem specifically target Jewish people for genocide? Well, they didn't. World War II was the Jews specifically targeting uh, Germans for Distinct, uh, for um, uh, extinction. 
that's what happened. There's even a book, a Jewish guy wrote a book about that. That's what he, we needed to do. They hired, you know, they hired, they, they hired other people to do the dirty work. The British and the Americans killed so many, um, you know, innocent men, women, and children there. I think that, I think that probably what would happen, you know, the, here's, okay, here's what happened is, you know, World War II, in a nutshell, the Germans wanted um, to be unharassed and free from the, you know, the banker, the international banking uh, people. Okay, and so he started, he went about that and made the nation very prosperous. And then um, he was being, I believe, harassed by them. I mean, they, they did conduct that, they tried an international boycott to try to hurt him. And um, they weren't going to just leave Germany alone. So I believe Hitler, f f you know, he, he thought that he needed to go out and clean him out of all of Europe um, and, and all of Russia as fast as he could. All, all the, um, the Jews were taking part in the Bolshevik um, agenda. And, you know, he bit off more than he could chew and he didn't have, he didn't, he, see, he didn't convince, he should have had, before he started doing that, <laughs> Uh, he should have um, convinced the Americans and the British um, that he was on the right track. In other words, you know, and, and he did, you know, eventually, I mean, after he was dead, I mean, he convinced General Pat. You know, had, he, he should have done that homework up front. Then, um, you know, th there would have been a better outcome for world history. You know. But it didn't happen. You know, and I asked myself, you know, why did God, why did God, why did God prevent him? Because he wasn't trying to kill, he wasn't trying to wipe out the Jews. He was a Zionist. He was trying to, he was trying to get the people that were controlling the Jewish controllers into Israel, so they'd have a place to go. They could harass, you know, they wouldn't be harassing everybody else. They could harass themselves, you know. Um, so I often wonder, you know, why, why, why in, in, in um, world history did God? Um, allow that evil outcome where, you know, here's Churchill, the murder, mass murder, um, Eisenhower, the mass murder, Roosevelt, the mass murder, or Stalin, the mass murder, you know, all um, sharing cigars and, <laughs> you know, making their next plans for the um, further, uh, you know, communist takeover of the world, you know, and, and basically that's that's all we did. That's what we did. That's what we accomplished in World, world War Two. Oh boy. Okay. So, so all right, yeah. So I wondered about that. I looked into it. And I found out what was going on there. Okay. Why did they take tenaciously hold on to the land presently occupied in the Middle East? Well, that's because um, they're supposed to be there, and um, I don't think that they really. I I, I think that they're. I think the tenacious holding on is, is 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 a false narrative. They got they're plenty powerful. They're plenty advanced. They 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 really don't have anything to worry about. Um, the problem is that they're trying to destroy the Western world. Why don't they just stick with Israel and you know keep Israel strong and prosperous and stop trying to destroy everybody else. That's all they need to do. You know, I, 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 um, I often, you know, this one I should, <laughs> here's my, here's my punishment for them is to sit them down, make them listen to uh, Olivia Newton-John's Have You Never Been Mellow? Because that message is what they, that message in that song is what they really need to um, learn. And you know what, it's interesting. Now here's a, here's a, I'm going to break off on this. I'll come back to this. I wanted to tell this personal story the other day. I was, um, I was in one of my accounts and I was promoting my um, idea of splitting America up and, you know, um, um, because I was talking to people who really hate Trump, you know, and, um, and you know, they just, you know, it's like ruining their lives, you know, <laughs> and 
<laughs> so I'm saying, well, look, why, why not, you know, why not just work to split up, like we have red states and blue states, and they could each be separate nations. And, um, you know, everybody would be happy. You get what you want. The, the you know, blue states would get what they want. The red states would get what they want. People would be happy. Well, that's the mature, adult, grown-up thing to do. You, you help accommodate people to have what they want. You don't need to um, force people to stay here and do this little um, Punch and Judy game that, that, that our government does every eight years with um, getting somebody that the right, right wing hates for eight years and then somebody left wing hates for eight years. And the reason people endure that is because they think they're going to get back. They, 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 don't want, they don't want people to be happy. What they want to do is force you under that. They like to use the government for, you know, they, they, they like, because the average person, I'm afraid the average person's a control freak. You know, this is what, if they would, if they would fight control freakism the way they fight racism, for instance, you know, <laughs> then maybe there would be a better world. We would, you know, um, maybe I would become a social justice warrior <laughs> because control freakism is really the poison it's the original sin. It's the original sin. And it's the reason that, you know, mankind fell in the Garden of Eden. And so I'm having this conversation. Somebody else comes along who is of that ilk of, you know, hate Trump. Kind of thing. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not a fan of Trump because I understand he's only a puppet. He can't, he can't, he can't be anything else. If he tries to be something other than a puppet, he'll end up like JFK. You know, so, I mean, maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's trying to do the best he can and, and, and save his life at the same time. I don't know, but the thing is, you know, you don't hear him go after the Federal Reserve. You don't hear him go after the Castle of Foreign Relations. And Henry Kissinger and those kinds of people, and they're the ones that really own and operate the United States. These people had people foolishly vote for presidents and thinking that's going to change something. We still have the same owners. They don't care. They don't care if you're looking at, you know, the puppet in the right hand or the puppet in the left hand. So, this guy comes in, he hears a conversation. He, he says, do, do you really think people are, are, are that fundamentally different? <laughs> you know? I said, yeah, I think people are that fundamentally different. I said, look, do you, do you lock your doors at night? He said, yes. Is it because you hate your neighbors? No, it's because you, there's something you want to preserve. You want to preserve your your domestic tranquility. And people have different reasons for protecting different things. You have different ideas about what a nation should look like. And not everybody has the same ideas. Well, he just, he just more or less... And, and not and not not these two words. He just didn't. He could have just said "f you," but he didn't. He's, you know, he might have well because he's just like, well, we're just got to get rid of the jerk in the White House or something, you know, something like this. But in other words, he didn't hear anything I had to say. He didn't care. As far as he's concerned, everybody's on his page. He's got the only le legitimate page. And if you're not on his page, then f you. And that's how the average person walks around in America. That's you know that's everybody of the Sean Hannitys of the world on the on the right hand side and the uh, and that marble mouth woman from Democracy Now. They're both they're both the haters of different colors, and they hate other people who want to have something different than they do. And they can't think to say, hey, wait a minute. Why are we doing it like this? We don't need to be together. We could be each have what we want. We could each live peacefully. You could have your, you know, democracy now world. And, you know, Sean Hannity could have his, you know, neocon world or whatever, which is not very good. I mean, the neocon world is actually part of the, I don't know what kind of world he, he wants. But, you know, I mean, I would have my, my, you know, what I would like the most is, is, is a Christian's, Christian nation. That's what I would like the most. And um, what's happening now, you know, think back on that article I read about Kate Smith is that, you know, what happened? How did this happen to us kind of thing? Well, look, because because our forefathers decided they were going to they were going to give up their 
freedom to have uh, a government like they wanted it. You know, they, they, in other words, individual colonies or individual states that didn't have to answer to one another. They gave that up for prosperity and safety. Now, now um, they're going to have to wait around until our country eventually fills up with Muslims like Europe is doing. And God forbid you try to defend yourself. <laughs> if you try to defend yourself, you know, um, you're going to be the hater and you're going to be condemned because the government is on the side of the Muslims because the government's owned by the same people that did 9-11 who um, are engaged right now in a war on whites and they want to destroy, you know, they want to destroy white people. They want to destroy Christians, whites especially. And um, they're going to do it um, because our forefathers were too stupid to say, hey, well, no, we don't want this freedom of religion crap. It's, it's, it's bullshit. Each state, each country should have their own religion. One religion per country. If, we, if we're a Christian, if, we're, if America is a Christian country or any, any part of America is Christian, where is it in writing? Why didn't they put it in writing? Well, what happens is they were outsmarted by... You know, the Jeffersons and Madisons, the Hamiltons and the Washingtons and the uh, uh, Benjamin Franklins of the world. And they were outsmarted because they said, hey, look, you sign here and die the line and we'll have a neutral society. Well, there's no such thing as a neutral society. It's by default a humanist society. And right now, that's why um, if you, they can point a finger and you said you committed a hate crime and it'll destroy your life if you hate speech, I mean, not even a crime, I mean, you don't even do a crime, just you have hate in your heart or whatever for they decided. And so now they're going to destroy your life because you broke, you blasphemed the humanist religion that, that, that's the official religion in the United States. People, just because it's not stated, it's not written down, that's the official religion because default, there's no other kind of religion you could have. I mean, if you wanted, if, if, if you really wanted a neutral system, then, the, you know, the senators, the congressmen, the so-called lawmakers, they would bring a, everybody would have a coin and when they had a, 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 you know, an issue they had to decide on, they flipped the coin and that way you'd be a neutral state. And they don't do that. I never seen them flip coins to decide on lawmaking. And since they don't do that, you know, there's something else, there's some, there's some um, philosophy behind, you know, there's some worldview behind what's you know who's allowed, or what's allowed to make laws in this country, and 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 they and they told us Christians that we're we're not welcome to, you know our values are not welcome, you know <laughs> because the separation of church and state. Well, see, I don't believe in America. I believe in a, a, you know I believe that there should be a Christian nation that break off of America, and that's all I care about. That's the only thing I'm you know that you put a candidate up like that and I'll vote for him. You know. But I, I told this guy, he was um, one of these guys, associates, affiliates of mine, was a, on about that Cortez woman, whatever her name is. You know, she'd be my hero if she was going after the Federal Reserve and the Castle Farm Relations, and she wanted to, you know, allow America to split up into a bunch of different kinds of nations. And, uh, yeah, I don't care who she is. I like her. If that's her, you know, if that's what she's promoting, I don't think she is. Okay, so <clears throat> my um, so yeah, I would like to encourage um, if you're a Christian to not believe in America because America is the great Satan. It's um, America's building the mystery Babylon, and so um, we need to go back to um, when our f forefathers came over here to start Christian societies. We need to demand the same thing. You know, um, you start with okay. Um, you, you're not going to allow um, a Christian worldview to um, address lawmaking. Then you can't take taxes from me. It's that simple. You start there, and you just keep going and going until we have our own country. You know, and I'm not just talking about taking over America for Christ. So the idea is no. Whoever wants to be part of this is volunteer. It's a small. Maybe it'll take. Maybe it'll be one or two states. Maybe it'll be. F you know, 30 states, and maybe the next state over will be um, a Muslim state. I don't care. Whatever you want, 
whatever, whatever you want, you're allowed to have it. Who says you're not allowed to have whatever nation you want? Who says that? Whoever says that is doing the work of Satan. That's all I can tell you. Okay, the answers to these questions are found in certain basic facts about the nation of Israel. And knowledge of these facts is essential if you are, or want to understand not only the issue, but God's plan and purpose for history. Okay, so this is back to this article about, you know, have you ever wondered? Um, early in uh, Israel's history, God placed the nation into a relationship with himself that no other nation was privileged to enjoy in conjunction with that relationship, Moses made the following statements. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, or unto Yahweh thy God. God, thy God, hath, Yahweh thy God has chosen thee, being a special people unto himself, above all people who are upon the face of the earth. Okay, so that, that's one of those, um, that's one of those, Verses that, that um, seem to fuel the, the, the what I think is 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 a wrong interpretation. I mean, he's he's not you know he's not saying to the Jews, okay, they're above because he, he always says that they're lower than other people. He's not really placing a, he's not placing them above all people. I, I like to go look at the original Hebrew and see what that is, because it's not really it's not really the correct thought here. He's not saying, okay, God. Um, is telling the Jews because he's always said you're the least of the people. He didn't say you're, you know, putting your. He made them. They're above in the sense that they had this special relationship, but they're not. They're not better people. See, that's where that's it. It's because they had this relation with God that you know made them privileged. You know, and Yahweh hath avowed the this day to be His peculiar people, and to make the high above all nations whom he hath made, in praise and in name and in honor, and that thou mayest uh, be a holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. But we know what happened. And, and you know, as the, as the history unraveled, eventually the God had to kick them out because they were unable to live up to that calling. Now, they're back in the land because this, I believe, is the end days. And um, what is going to happen is the um, uh, Europeans and uh, the white people are going to say, hey, why are we allowing these you know, Jews to sick the Muslims on us? You know? <laughs> and they're going to say, this is effed up. And they are going to want to do something about it. And they will do something about it. And they will succeed in getting those control freaks out of their respective lands. I mean, think about it. What happens when, you average, when an average American becomes common knowledge that Israelis and American Jews did 9-11? Wouldn't we be quick to get rid of... Uh, you know, George Soros, Henry Kissinger, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Federal Reserve, and then send them over to Israel, for instance. I think that, we, you know, that would be the right thing to do. I think that's what God wants us to do. So this is, this is a God-ordained um, reaction to um, the Jewish people who are trying to conduct a war on whites. God is emboldening and, and strengthening the Gentiles to correct this wrong. Now, I think what's going to happen is they're going to go too far and they're going to try to, you know, destroy Israel in the process. They're probably going to try to destroy a lot of Christians too in the process. And I'll say that because uh, what I was saying before, Christians have been led to believe that the moral obligation is to allow anybody into their nation. Everybody and anybody, you know. And um, the white pagans are, and European pagans are seeing that as, hey, you know, the Christians aren't helping. They're, they're not helping preserve, you know, the lives of the whites. They're actually, you know, working with the Jews to destroy the whites. You know, that, that's how they see it. And, and, and I'm saying, look, you know, Christians got to wake up to the fact that that's not a moral um, obligation that, 
morally speaking, what Jesus would do is allow people to associate and disassociate with whomever they want. And he allowed people to include or exclude whomever they want. The Bible is all about inclusion and exclusion. And Jesus is all about exclusion and inclusion. You know, so this idea that you're just supposed to let anybody in is 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 um, of Satan. It's it's the you know the rebuild. It's the mystery Babylon. And I think that's that that's how I'm going to that's how I'm going to label the war on whites. The war on whites is mystery Babylon. Okay, and so Christians are not supposed to be part of the mystery Babylon. We know this from the scriptures. You know, Revelation tells us to come out of mystery Babylon. Don't be part of it. So that's mystery Babylon is 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 going along with this idea that okay we're we're just going to allow you know all these Muslims in and then you know they're going to start beheading people left and right and, and that's just fine and dandy you know? I mean that's just that's just wonderful you know, um, you know that that's <clears throat> I don't see that as I don't see that as um, the right thing to do I I I, I think that. Um, you know, you know. Jesus talked about you know who who among you would give a, something bad to your child if they asked for a gift. You give them something nice. You know. I mean, I, I think that I think that the even my friends that don't agree with me, my Christian friends that don't agree with me, uh, they at least they agree that since Christ came into the world, the world become a better place. That um, there has been. Uh, you know, the high trust societies, I believe, are, are, are mostly a product of you know, Christianity coming into the teachings of Christ, um, you know, faith in Christ, you know, <clears throat> the transformation that Christ makes in, in individuals' lives, is what brought about high trust society and you know, prosperity, modern medicine, modern science, and all these things. A result of um, generations of people who, uh, you know, you're trying to put God first in their lives, and, and and the thing is, what happens is if you if you fail, there's consequences, and I think to get back on track, you know, the there I mean there is an awful lot in the Book of Revelation about people being beheaded, Christians being beheaded, and so forth, and. Um, you know, the New World Order is using the religion of decapitation. You know, I think that's how, <clears throat> unfortunately, um, people are not going to listen to me. <laughs> people aren't going to, people, the Christians are not going to say, hey, you know what, we got to push this association, disassociation idea to the max um, and, and demand. You know, our, our forefathers demanded that they, they, it was their relationship with God was important enough for them to move to a new, a new land and start over, kind of thing. You know, um, it should be important enough to us to, to want to claim um, a couple, a few dozen states here and there. You know, what I mean, or at least let's start with one or something. You know, we we got to be able to claim something, at least demand, at least put that forward. Say, okay, here's the. Um, Here's a, here's our lobby. Okay, we got a, a Washington lobby. This is what we're lobbying for. You know, it should be it should be an everyday conversation, just like everyday conversation might be. You know, you know look how they're treating Trump in the press. You know, it's terrible. What, the everyday conversation be, when are we going to get the freedom of association back? When are you going to be able to establish your own, you know, city, state, or nation as sovereign? That's what the conversation would be. Who cares about Trump and the press and all that? It's a puppet show. You got It's not meaningful. You got. They still has the same owners. We still got the same owners. You got to get rid of those owners. You got to own your own. You got to own your own nation. Okay, so um, uh, I could read this whole article. It's pages. There's a lot of pages. I wonder if I should read this now. Or people haven't talked long enough. Let me see. It's an hour and forty minutes. I, I don't know. I. I don't think so. Uh, I'll read it. Let's read it. Um, you know, uh, I often I'll listen to two hours of red eyes, four hours of red eyes. You know, I, I you know, I hope I'm at least that interesting as <laughs> somebody red eyes guess. 
Um, okay, so uh, this unique relationship involved a number of special privileges. First, it involved Israel's adoption as God's firstborn son. Second, Israel was permitted to hear God's voice at Mount Sinai. Third, Israel saw and enjoyed a unique association with the Shekinah glory of God. Um, God established covenants with Israel that he never established with any other people. God gave the Mosaic law to Israel alone. Six, only Israel had the worship structures, the tabernacle, the temple where God dwelt in a unique sense in the uh, divinely ordained priesthood and sacrificial system of those structures. Uh, seventh, God made promises to Israel that he made to no other nation. And he lists the promises, you know, that um, Israel had a unique uh, intimate access to God. God intervened in history in an um, unparalleled supernatural way to deliver Israel from its slavery in Egypt. Tenth, God gave Israel permanent ownership of the land of Canaan. Eleventh, God made Israel's land and capital city, Jerusalem, holy or unique because he dwelt there in a unique sense. It's important to note that God established his unique relationship with Israel forever. He intended that relationship to be permanent. King David declared, <coughs> And what one nation in the earth is like thy people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem for people to himself, and to make him a name, and to do for you great things and terrible for the, thy land, people, thy people, which thou redeemest to thee from Egypt, from the nations and their gods. For thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people, Israel, to be a people unto thee forever, and thou, Lord, art to be thy God. Okay, now... There's, you know, other details that we got to include here. For instance, the fact that um, when Jesus came and they rejected him, that um, the Gentiles were now allowed to become Jews in the sense that they were now considered God's chosen people. So God's chosen people are not just Jews. They're, they, you have to be a Jew who believes in Jesus. And... Now, there are always been two kinds of Jews. There's always been Jews of the flesh and Jews of the faith. And we see this throughout the, you know, throughout the scriptures, even when, for instance, Aaron made the golden calf, and they decided, okay, who's for, who's for you know, Yahweh, who, and who's for these other gods? And you know, they had uh, schisms where they were to kill off the non-believers. And... Um, that has happened uh, numerous times, um, but the you know, children of the faith were the ones that, who, who you know, eventually came to accept Jesus as Messiah. The children of the flesh were the ones that were rejected and scattered around the world and were um, uh, um, called back. Um, that the promise of the land was to, I believe, the children of the flesh. So there's promises God made to the flesh of Israel and the promises of the faith. And the faith of Israel now includes Gentiles. Um, and um, I sort of have a theory that maybe the reason, because people say, well, you know, why are the Israelites back in the land? Is Maybe there's ten percent of them believe in that Jesus is the Messiah. That's very possible. Yeah. There are a lot of Jews. Now it's interesting. That, it's interesting how I was listening to um, that guy who um, Dennis Prager, who I, I rarely listen to these right wing talk guys. But once in a while I listen to them. It sounds like they're saying something interesting. Let's see what they're saying. You know, um, he had a couple guys call him up and sharing God, passages from the Old Testament that, that were prophesying you know, Jesus in the New Covenant. You know, he says, well, you know, some guy came and wrote, you know, we, we have a New Covenant, you know, and, and, and this kind of thing, and, you know, uh, different passages from Zechariah and the, the different prophets. And, um, another guy came and, and you know, read something else and you know questioning why why doesn't Dennis Prager why don't the Jewish people see Jesus as the Messiah and Prager said well 
we don't reject Jesus because we don't think he qualifies as the Messiah. We reject Jesus because he's supposedly deity, which I thought was really, this is really interesting. So in other words, <clears throat> you can believe in, um, you could be, almost believe in anything and be Jewish, so long as you don't believe that Jesus is um, deity. Okay, well, I, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of Jews who also say, well, you, you know, if you consider yourself a Christian or you believe in Jesus as, as the Messiah, that you're also not Jew you can't be Jewish anymore, even if you were, you know, your mother and father were Jewish all the way back to, um, you know, Moses. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, um, they, they, you know, they would still disqualify. I mean, this is what they did at the time of Jesus. You know, if you if you, I mean, they had the same kind of shaming and social justice um, uh, tactics that they that they do now, where you know, if you believe in this man, and we, you know, we're gonna kick you out of the synagogue, you know, and you're gonna be, you know, you'd be, you know, you won't be able to work, you know, if you, if you, I guess, were a business person, and you know, you had Jewish clientele, the Jews would boycott you, or if you were working for a Jewish guy, you would lose your job or whatever. Back then, seeing this same thing going on. So um, I thought it was interesting that Prager says this because he's saying the same thing that the, that the Pharisee said to Jesus. So Dennis Prager is a Pharisee by definition. He's, because the Pharisees said almost the same thing to Jesus. You know, they were condemning Jesus. He says, you know, they, they wanted to kill him. And Jesus says, I've done many great works. For which of these are you going to stone me? I said, we're not going to stone you for the great works. We're stoning you because you, you being a man, make yourself out to be God. Um, and so, this is Dennis Prager picking up stones. I wonder if he would actually do that if, if push came to shove. You know, I don't know. I, 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 you know, just because somebody, you know, carries himself with such a civilized demeanor and you know, rapport and so forth. I mean, you know, who knows? If push comes to shove, he pick up a stone and throw it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't, you know, I can't judge people. Ah, let me see. Anyway. <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's see. Right, okay. So, and what one, okay, here we go. It's important to note that God established a unique relationship with Israel forever. He intended the relationship to be permanent, King David declared. Okay, well, we read that. All right, so. Um, God did not choose Israel to be his special people because they were better than other people. That's what I was saying. See, they were not better. They were descendants of Adam and Eve, as were all people. Thus, they were born with the same corrupt human nature and tendency to rebel against God, as were the Gentiles. Even David, Israel's great king, recognized that he was shaped in iniquity and conceived in a state of sin. Moses repeatedly warned the people of Israel that they would tend to stray from God and his ways. And he told them, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people for you were fewer than all people. If God did not choose the people of Israel because they were better than other people, why then did he choose them for a unique relationship? According to scriptures, he did it based on his own sovereign will. On the basis of his sovereign will, God performed two special deeds for Abraham Isaac and Jacob, Israel's ancestors. First, he made those ancestors the special objects of his love. And second, he established a special covenant, the Abrahamic covenant with them. The fact that God chose Israel not because the nation was better than any other, but because of two special deeds he performed based on his own sovereign will seems to imply that God had a sovereign purpose for the nation. Okay. Here's a little intermission music. Okay. Um, God has a unique purpose for Israel. At least two details indicate that God indeed has a unique purpose for Israel. First, God declared that he created Israel for his glory. The word glory refers to what is impressive, demands recognition, or gives a person influence. Thus, God's declaration indicated that in a unique sense, he has proposed through Israel to impress the world with himself to obtain the world's recognition 
and to gain influence in the lives of human creatures. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because um, I think about, like, you know, the Rothschilds, uh, $500 trillion. Well, that's, you know, that's a lot of money. And, um, you know, I think in, in this case, God has allowed Satan to, to give him that money. And... Um, you know, arrange that, or, you know, arrange the situation so that they accumulated, they, they accumulated that kind of wealth and, and, and control. Um, but I don't think, you know, they're, for a minute that they're on God's side, God's using them, you know. Um, but you have to, you have to admit, this is kind of a super, a supernatural, a supernatural thing that this, this one particular, you know, family is able to go around the world, the Western world at the time, and just say, by the way, we, you know, we'll be printing your money, and um, we'll lend it to you. You can just pay us back, you know, at, uh, with interest. <laughs> and um, you know, it's not, you know, it's not whatever it costs us to print money. You know, I mean, um, you know, you could have a, a, a same piece of paper with a hundred or one on it, um, or ten thousand or whatever. Um, and they didn't really work for that money, see, but you got to. If they, if they lend you that money, you know, you have to stand behind the grind wheel for eight hours, to, you know, just to pay it back with real labor and real sweat, see. So, uh, you know, this is, this, is, you know, this is not something to sort of think, well, you know, these people did this on their own. No, you can't do this without, this is supernatural intervention. Second, when God established the Abraham covenant, he not only promised to make a great nation, of Abraham's physical descendants, but he also vowed that all families of the earth would be blessed through that nation. God therefore indicated that he pur purposed Israel to function as a unique channel for his blessing to the whole world. How does God through Israel bring blessing to the world and glorify himself before, thereby fulfilling his unique purposes for that nation? He does so several ways. Early in the nation's national history, Moses promised the Israelites that if they heeded God's word and obeyed him, he would do the following for them. Oh, by the way, I better give the person credit who wrote this. Let me see before I get that. I wonder if I'm allowed to read all this. I guess I am. I don't see what, okay. Oh, Reynolds Showers. He was, um, he was one of the professors there at uh, the, uni the university that I um, audited classes in. I never had showers, though, but I, I heard he was good. Um, and I never took... I never went to college for credit. I just went there to recruit evangelists for my street evangelism ministry. And I ordered the classes. So, you know, I kind of fit in a little bit, but not really. Not really. Yeah. And by today's standard, boy, I really would. If I, today, I really wouldn't fit in. I, at any rate, um, second one, okay, so, okay, um, here's how he did this through. Here's how he... Um, used Israel to bless the nation. Okay, early in Israel's national history, Moses promised the Israelites that if they heeded God's word and obeyed him, he would do the following for them. The Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. The Lord shall cause thy enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be um, uh, beneath. Moses also promised that if the Israelites rejected God's word and disobeyed him, then the following would happen to them. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke, and all that thou settest thy hand unto for thee to do. Okay. I'll put the background music on louder. <laughs> okay, so... um. Okay, uh, all right, let's see. Okay, so, um, therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies which the Lord sends against thee. The Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even to the other. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee a trembling heart and a failing of eyes and sorrow of mind, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt f f fear the day and night, 
and shall have no assurance of thy life. Okay, so this is, remember the way they were asking about, well, what about all this anti semitic Well, this is what this is what it was all about. It's like, okay, you screwed up, people are going to get pissed, you know, that's not too surprising. Uh, the result of God's blessing Israel above all other nations, if it heeded and obeyed his word, would be as follows. And all the people that are shall see that thou art called by the name Yahweh, and thou shalt be afraid of thee. The result of God uh, chastening Israel more severely than other nations, if it rejected and disobeyed his word, would be this. And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, a byword among the nations, with whether the Lord uh, God Yahweh sends thee, and thou shalt uh, be upon thee as a sign for a wonder. So, right here God is saying, you know, you're going to be sort of like, um, you know, a, a, a um, persona non grata, you know, you're going to be living there, you're going to be living in these places, the people aren't really going to um, be too thrilled about it. You know? um, and, and, you know, there's this, you know, it's almost like, I know growing up, for me, growing up, people, um, you know, if you said the word Jew, they kind of like, they would laugh, you know, it's kind of like, it seemed like, it just seemed like a, a derision, you know, just the, the name um, for so many people. And I think that, see, it goes back to what I was saying about racism. I mean, you, you, if somebody's racist because something happened, you know, it's not like it's, people don't do things in a vacuum. That's like when, when the, the, you know, Hitler, the, the way I, the way I, when I was brought up in school, the way the Hitler, the World War II was like Hitler woke up one morning and said, hmm, what am I going to do today? Uh, let me see. Maybe I'll kill all the Jews. You know, I mean, that's the way it was presented. So, so, so ridiculous, so foolish, so childish, you know, and, and um, so people usually have reasons uh, if they're, you know, racist or, you know, anti-Semitic or something. You know, there's something behind it. It's like 90, 99% of it's justified because there, there's some there's something that happened that you know that that, that you know, brought that if then scenario. It's not like you know it's, it's not like an unprovoked if then scenario. Now you know there are occasions, but the, the, it's it's really it's really the exception if somebody just you know is so immature that they, you know, don't like somebody just be for superficial reasons. That that would be by far the exception. Nobody, people aren't that, you know, people aren't that shallow. All right, anyway, let me get back to this. Uh, these statements ind indicate that God intended to make Israel an object lesson to the rest of the world. His dealings with Israel are designed to impress the world with two facts about God. God blesses those who heed and obey his word, and God will severely judge those who reject and disobey his word. Okay, another way God brings blessing to the world and glorifies himself is through Israel, is through the unique book that is given to the world. The Bible is the only book that has been divinely inspired. In it, God has revealed ultimate reality, the purposes of history and life, the origin and destiny of man, how sinful man can be made right with the holy God, and how people are to live. Over the centuries, God's book has brought untold blessings to great multitudes of people. God gave the Bible to the world almost exclusively through the nation Israel. This fact indicates that God purposed Israel to be the instrument through which he would give the world its most significant book. Um, a third way God has glorified himself and brought blessing through Israel has been through the Messiah, Savior, Jesus Christ. When Adam, who had been appointed by God to function as his representative to administer his rule over the world, yielded to Satan's temptation to rebel against God, Satan thereby usurped the rule of the world system away from God. The angelic enemy of God has been dominating the world system ever since. In addition, man's original sin of rebellion against God brought tragic consequences for the earth and himself. For example, man experienced a radical spiritual change, spiritual death, and became subject to God's eternal judgment. 
Immediately after man's original sin of rebellion, God announced that the key to his crushing of Satan and his evil rule in the world would be the coming and work of a special redeemer who would be born of a woman. Through the Old Testament prophets, God revealed two major lines of truth concerning this coming redeemer. First, the redeemer would be the savior of the world. Second, the redeemer would crush Satan and his world rule would reestablish God's rule over the world system and would be God's Messiah King, his last representative to administer his rule over the entire earth. So this kind of this gives me the idea where, you know, um, God's allowing this new world order um, to build up. Um, when Jesus comes, he will, you know, take over from the Rothschilds <laughs> and it will be much nicer. Um, <clears throat> and there will be no more war on whites, for instance, okay. Uh, okay, his last representative to administer his rule over the entire earth. Since the Messiah's Savior was born of a woman, he obviously would come into the world through the nation the woman belonged to. Through the Old Testament prophets, God revealed that Israel was the nation through which um, the Messiah would come. The Messiah, Savior, Jesus Christ, did indeed come through Israel. Uh, he was born of Mary, a young, righteous Jewish um, through his suffering and death. And by the way, when he says she was righteous, I mean, she was a sinner. <laughs> you know, she was, uh, relatively speaking, you know, righteous. But she was a sinner just like that. This, and this is an interesting point. I mean, you know, I've got to make this point with the Muslims because, you know, um, you know, how could Mary being a sinner bring Jesus into the world? Well, Jesus being, um, his flesh being human, but his spirit being God, you know, made everything right. That's why he could touch lepers and the leper would be clean. It wouldn't be, he wouldn't get dirty. It'd be the other way around. And the same with Mary, see. Through his suffering death on the cross, he took away the sin of the world and thereby provided salvation for man. At his second coming, he will crush Satan and rule, reestablish God's rule over the world system, and be God's Messiah King, the last Adam to administer God's rule over the entire earth. Thus God purposed the, it, that Israel would be the channel through which the key figure of all time would come, the Messiah Savior through whom God fulfills his purpose for history and brings great blessing to the world. Through repentance, there is a fourth way God will glorify himself and bring blessings to Israel. The scripture indicate that the Messiah will not crush Satan and reestablish God's rule over the world system until the nation of Israel repents of its rebellion against God. This repentance involves reconciliation with Jesus Christ, the Messiah's Savior. For this reason, John the Baptist, Jesus, and the apostles preached the gospel of the kingdom. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand to Israel only. The fact indicates that God has purposed Israel to be a significant key in the future fulfillment of his purpose for history. <clears throat> Israel has a unique future. Okay. According to scripture, Israel's unique future will have a twofold nature. First, it will be characterized by unequaled suffering. Satan has attacked Israel many times throughout history because the Redeemer, God's key to crushing Satan, was born through Israel. Satan repeat, repeatedly stirred up anti-Semitism against that nation in Old Testament times, hoping to prevent the Redeemer from coming because uh, Messiah will not crush Satan and reestablish God's rule over the world system until Israel repents. Satan has attacked that nation ruthlessly since Christ's first coming, trying to destroy it before it can repent. All right, it says the Holocaust. Well, the thing is, no, the way, the way Satan, the way Satan... Uh, brings about anti-Semitism is through the behavior of the Jews. He gets the Jews behave evilly, and the Gentiles react. That's how it happens. It's not like see it's, this guy. See this the same this mythology that somehow you know people are just walking around minding their own business, and all of a sudden they decide they want to go after the Jews. It's not the way it works. Say the right way the way Satan will provoke anti-Semitism is through behavior of the Jewish people. That's how he does it. 
you know, I mean, what do you think is going to happen when, when it becomes common knowledge that, that you know, Israeli and Jewish Americans did 9-11? I mean, you know, that's, you know, that's not an arbitrary anti-Semitism, you know, that's not, that's not arbitrary. Despite how, how terrible these past assaults have been, uh, Israel's worst days are still ahead. During the last three and one half years prior to Christ's second coming, Satan, realizing his time is growing short, will try to annihilate Israel in a manner unparalleled in history. This peril will be so bad that scripture calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah describes it as an unprecedented time of great tribulation and indicates that two-thirds of the people of Israel will die. And that's in um, Jeremiah, Daniel, Matthew, Zechariah. Second, Israel's future also will be characterized by unequal blessing. God will permit Satan to cause Israel's worst time of suffering as his means of bringing that nation to repentance. The survivors, one-third of Israel, repent when they see Jesus Christ in his glorious second coming and recognize that he is the true Messiah. In response to Israel's repentance, God will forgive the nation's sins, Messiah will crush Satan and his rule, and will reestablish God's rule over the earth world system for a thousand years. During this future rule of God through Messiah, Israel will enjoy unique blessings. The nation will be in a right relationship with God and obedient to him. Israel will be the spiritual minister of the world, leading the Gentiles in the worship of God. A magnificent temple will be built in Jerusalem as a center of worship. All nations will come to Jerusalem to worship God, receive instruction, and have judicial matters settled. The people of Israel will be restored permanently to their homeland, and God will prosper them abundantly. So it's interesting to note about the way that you know nations are... are um, are still there. There's always going to have nations. This idea that New World Order is going to get rid of nations is not in the Bible. I mean, they'll try, but they won't be able to succeed. In light of God's unique purpose for Israel to glorify himself before the world and to bring blessing to the world through Israel, it was essential that God place the nation in a unique location where it would have attention and influence out of proportion to its size. God did exactly that. He gave Israel the land of Canaan perhaps the most strategic location in the world for attention and influence. Canaan is the crossroads of Asia, Africa, and Europe. And for centuries, the major trade military routes of the ancient world passed through that land. Because of Israel's location, the major world powers have had to deal with that nation. Moses clearly taught that God gave Israel the land that belongs to the Jewish people. He gave it not because the nation deserved it, but because of his own sovereign purposes. Therefore, Israel's ownership of the land does not depend on the nation's merit. Moreover, the fulfillment of Israel's unique God-ordained future requires that it own the land of Canaan forever. This is so because that future involves Israel's permanent restoration to that land. And in line with this requirement, God, through Abrahamic covenant, so solemnly guaranteed Israel's permanent ownership of the land. So that's pretty good. I mean, I, I pretty much agree with everything there. I, it's... Uh, you know, I, I just, except for the fact that he doesn't have his World War II history and he doesn't understand that, you know, anti Semitism is not an isolated, arbitrary, uh, you know, event that just, you know, people just decide, okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hate Jews, you know, just for no reason. It just, it's, you know, it's a pastime or something. That's just ridiculous. It doesn't work that way. You know, the world's a lot more sophisticated than that's that, you know, people do things for reasons. Um, you know, um, the, the exception, like I said, a rare exception is if somebody does something arbitrarily. Yeah, you know, for, or at least for superficial reasons, you know, or maybe, you know, there's some, but, you know, the, the you know, I think even the, even this idea that, even after the, you know, after the, the Gentiles were able to kick out, you know, the Jews from, you know, and what I'm talking about is, you know, the ones that are ruling everything. I think that, you know, um, you know, a Jewish person who, um, 
understands that they're in a foreign land and they're not interested in controlling it or, or, or you know, promoting Marxist cultural culture or anything like that, you know, or they're, you know, they believe in Jesus or something, you know. I mean, I don't think anybody's seeking to get rid of somebody like that. Now, they might want to leave, you know, but, but, um, um, my point, you know, after they, after the, if the Gentile nations succeed in doing that, then, you know, then, then they're going to, you know, and I, I think they'll have a reason. They'll think, well, you know, we better destroy them all because they could come back out of, you know, and they'll come back again. You know? Um, and that, you know, I think that's where they're going too far. You know, the, the, the this is what is, you know, be the catalyst to bring Jesus back. Because they won't, they're not going to be able to destroy Israel. God's not going to let that happen. But, um, you know, my message to Christians is, look, you don't have to worry about Israel. It's, you don't have to, you don't have to cover up their crimes or pretend like they can do no wrong or whatever. You know, they, they have to pay for their sins. And the thing is, it's not going to prevent them from God from delivering on his promise. Not like that promise is fragile and it's going to be, you know, you're, you're going to you're going to prevent it from happening. No, but you can't be, you can't turn yourself into the synagogue of Satan just to protect, you know, because you think that God is not capable of, you know, bringing Israel and if they have to pay for their sins at the same time. You know, that World War One there was a, a terrible amount of murder that took place because these people were, were orchestrating it and getting pulling the strings behind the scene to get to get people to kill each other. World War II was the same type of event where these power mongers, you know, I mean, they, they even say World War, the purpose of World War I was to get rid of the monarchs. The purpose of World War II was to get rid of nation state, na uh, sovereign nations as the best they could. It, you know, it was, it was the beginning, it was the first real dig-in and uh, they think they need one more war, war to, to you know, finish it off and, and, and have this one more, one more government. And, you know, this is where I'm not sure what's going to happen. I mean, my, my, you know, my thing is, I, you know, I don't, I'm not going to be a part of any more, more, more wars. I'm not, you know, the, the only war I'd be in if somebody's actually in front of my house, like shoot, you know, or shooting at my friends. Or something like that, but um, but if they say, you know, look, uh, you know, Iran, nuclear weapons, so what? I don't care, you know. Um, North Korea, North Korea, that's that's almost like comical. <laughs> North Korea, and you know what? It's funny because I, I th you know, there's just like I think there's only three. I think it's maybe Iran, North Korea, and um, Venezuela, or something like that. There's only like three countries that aren't part of that whole central banking system, you know, and, and the ones, you know, that, um, you know, so that's, that's the, that's why they would, see, that's what you'd be going to war for. If you're going to war for, it's not because we're really under a threat of, you know, North Korea. <laughs> um, it's because they want to, they want them to come under their control. And so, so you go out there and you kill all these innocent people. So that these, you know, communist control freak trillionaires leave me more powerful, have more control over, over you and your your children, your grandchildren, and you're not doing us any favor. So you know, think about it before you, you know, join any war. You're really not doing anybody any favor. You're really fighting against us. The, the American soldiers fought against freedom in World War One. They fought against freedom in World War II. And now they're fighting against freedom by, by believing in the 9-11 lies, you know? And so stop fighting against freedom. You should be fighting for freedom. That is, you should be telling our government, look, this is bullshit. We're, we're, we're tired of, um, we're tired of the bullshit. We're tired of um, being controlled and, 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 and having these owners that are like doing all this social engineering and, and you know attacking people and trying to cultivate a nation of cowards 
and we don't want it. We're not going to be part of it. We're not part of this nation. We're, we'll start our own nation. Thank you. That's where we got to go. That's what that's what I honor. You want me to salute a flag? Of, you know, fly that flag. I'll salute it. In the meantime, I'm not saluting the kingdom of Satan and the, 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 you know, mystery Babylon. You know, that's that's all there is to it. I, you know, I'm 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 not gonna. I'm not living. I'm not going off this planet. Thinking, oh yeah, I lived my life as a coward and I was afraid to say anything because protect my, you know, protect my ass from, you know, these control freaks. You know, f you. I'm done. You know, I'm done with it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to tell, say whatever I want to anybody about anything. I don't care what it costs me. I'm done. It's over, baby. You know, <laughs> you you know, you're going to hear the truth from me and nothing but the truth. I'm not interested in kissing anybody's ass or being a fake, phony, patriotic, you know, useful idiot for trillionaire control freaks that just want to turn the country on us, the whole of the government, you you know, oh look, this person's a hater, that's a person of the race, you destroy their lives. This person said, you know, this person wore black face at Halloween, you know, <laughs> 30 years ago, destroy them. That's the country I'm fighting for, that's the flag I'm saluting, F you, I'm not saluting that flag, that flag needs to be burnt. That's it, that's all, you know, it pisses me off if I, you know, I'm trying to, I, I try to do these, I try to do these videos and try to keep jolly and <laughs> positive, but you know what? If you're gonna do this kind of crap, if you're gonna, if, if, if that's what this nation stands, that's where we're going. That's why, you know, that's why I say Hitler should have won. Uh, you know, we, we fought on the wrong side because all it did was open the gates of communism in, in, into America. It's a Bolshevik bullshit nation where they're, they're trying to turn us all into cowards. You're afraid to talk, you're afraid to speak, you're afraid to do this, you're afraid to do that. And that's, <laughs> you know, that's what, that's it. It's over, baby. It's over. It's over. I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not doing, you know, this is not like one of these, you know, videos where I'm going to go out and, you know, do something crazy. I'm going to just sit here and I'm going to continue my talk. I'm going to continue to speak. Um, and, you know, next couple of weeks I'll have another video. I'll find something in the New York Times or somewhere like that. And I'll speak about it. And I'll be very honest. And, and, and um, you know... Um, uh, look, John the Baptist lost his head because he was being honest about the corrupt government. Uh, Jesus lost his life, uh, mostly because he was going after the rulers. And, you know, they didn't like the fact that somebody was challenging him. You know, so, um, you know, I'm not going to pussyfoot around. I'm not going to, you know, I, I really, I mean, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go to my grave. So, oh, Jesus, I'm afraid of. if I say this, they're going to do this to me. And if I say that, they're going to do that to me. That's not the way I am. That's not, that's not it, maybe. That's not it. That's not me. I'm one of those people you're going to have to kill. I'm one of those people you got to kill. Because I'm not going to shut up. And I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go away. I'm, I'm just going to keep talking. And I'm going to keep telling the truth. And, uh, and that's it. I mean, you know, you don't live for the truth. You're either a truther or you're a liar. That's uh, that's how I, I put it. So, you know, and I you know I'd like to get this out. I'd like to get I'd like to get this uh, set this in the record straight before they start the war. You know, they, this is the, before they win because the, they're going to try to start. They're going to do something. You know, even like even say for instance with North Korea, what they would do is um, they would drop a you know they, like a mini nuke or something in New York City. You know. They, set a nuke off in Times Square and say, oh, our intelligence, the CIA, says we trace this back to the North Koreans. And they snuck in this country with a suitcase by. You know? And that's how they would do it. They would they would, they would, would think of some way, you know, they, they don't care if they kill, they don't care who they kill. They look what they did in 9-11. You know, they don't care about killing people. That's Whatever they got to do, whatever they got to do to control people, it goes back to what I was saying about control. It's a shame that that's how people that's how people act. You know, they want to control others. They they want to they say, okay, well, look, I'm you know pro-abortion. You're anti-abortion, so I'm going to try to fight for to make you have to live in a anti-abortion country, and you're going to try to fight to make me live in a pro-abortion country. And we're going to just fight each other. And we're not going to say, hey, wait a minute, let's split off and have two different countries. No, because that would be too loving. That would be too kind. That would be too gracious. That's the gracefulness of, of Christ showing. And, and, you know, if you don't have Christ, you're not going to do that. You're not going to, you're not going to be willing to allow people that kind of freedom. 
the graciousness, you know, the graciousness to, to allow somebody, if they, if they have racist feelings, to allow them to have those feelings. If they have, you know, if they're, if they're angry about something and they, and they hate somebody or something, they, you allow them to hate. That's a right. There's nothing wrong with it. You don't let them hate. That's, you know, it's not your business to try to prevent people from hating or anything like that. It's not the governor's business. You know, lighten up. I mean, yeah, if somebody's going to do something violent or something, you could stop them, that's fine, and, you know. But not, you know, this idea that, okay, look, this person, you know, said something that, you know, <laughs> whatever. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. So I, you got to lighten up and let people, you know, I always, anytime, whether it was a black racist or a white racist, I never cared. Let them, let them, they probably got reasons, you know, mad about something, somebody mistreated them. You know, let them have some room to vent. You know, where's the grace? Where's the love? Where? Why? Why, why am I the? You know, I'm the Christian. I'm. I'm the Christian. Is saying, lighten up. I'm the Christian. Says, let people have what they want. And, you know, separate separate nations and stuff like that. And I'm supposed to be the hater. I mean, what the hell? I'm the only one who's preaching love. I'm the, I'm, I got a solution. that's actually loving. You know. The loving thing is to separate people. The troublemakers. You know, uh, you read Rev Book of Revelation. Okay, here's here's what I'm telling people today, and I, I gotta I gotta you know, I gotta get the passages together. Okay, Jesus said, "Pray on earth as it is in heaven." Okay, so how is it in heaven? Where you go and you look at the Book of Revelation in heaven? There's none of these kinds of people. And there's none of those kinds of people. There's none of these and none of those, and that's how it is in heaven. And it's it's based on behavior it's based on whether you you know whether you believed in God and believe and, and let Jesus rule over your life or whether you didn't you wanted you were selfish and you wanted to do it on your own or it's based on you know you were a murderer or a thief or you know, a liar um, and there's a whole bunch of things that you know will uh, um, exclude you from heaven and then so there's like it's a very exclusive. It's a very exclusive worldview that, that Jesus promoted, and so if we are going to have on earth it is in heaven, then we have to be free to make these exclusive and exclusive, inclusive and exclusive um, arrangements and. Um, associations and disassociations, and, and and that should be you know, what Christians consider a moral imperative, or you know, moral high ground, or, or moral obligation, or whatever is okay. Let's you know, instead of preaching, everybody's welcome here. It should be no. Let's look what the Bible says about who's welcome, and who's not, and and and. And arrange our society that way, on earth as it is in heaven, and let other people arrange their societies how they want. If they want a society that's based on, you know, um, theft and murder and violence, then let them let them have it. That's they're welcome to it. They're not going to. It's not our business to stop people from doing that. The thing is, if they were trying to do it to us, we we were entitled to stop them. That's why, when Jesus said before he left the earth, he encouraged the disciples to sell something to buy a sword but today today's language would be buy a gun you know because you're well you're allowed to protect yourself you're allowed to use violence to protect yourself you're not to do violence in any kind of offensive matter or you know to try to <laughs> destroy other people or anything like that but you are encouraged to do it for protection so I guess this went on long enough. I, you know, it. Um, maybe you know people will learn from my example. Say, hey, you know what? I'm not going to condemn somebody f because somebody said they're racist. That I'm not going to condemn somebody because somebody said they're a hater. I'm not going to condemn somebody because somebody said they're a neo-Nazi. And I'm not going to condemn somebody because somebody said they're anti-Semitic. And I'm not going to condemn somebody because. You know, somebody said they're xenophobic, and I'm not going to condemn somebody because somebody said that they're homophobic, or I'm not going to condemn somebody because you know, 
they're not, in, uh, you know, friendly to same-sex marriage or whatever. See, I'm not going to condemn somebody because they're Islamic phobic. I'm not, you know. Um, in fact, that those people I will relate to because those are probably people who are not cowards. <laughs> they're they're um, brave enough to, you know, share what they really believe and what they really think. So as America continues to cavult, uh, cultivate a nation of cowards, they, uh, America will find that I'm not cooperating. And so, um, you know, <laughs> so that's like, I don't know, I, don't, I wonder if that's considered a, a hey, look, let me straighten my lip. I wonder if that's considered a, um, a statement of war. Maybe I'm, I'm considered a, uh, um, enemy, a, dom a, a domestic enemy, <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not going to be turned into a coward. I guess that, does that turn me into a domestic enemy? Wow. Wow, that's where we come to, you know, that's where, that's where we're going, you know. If you're, if you're not a coward, you're an enemy of the state. You're an enemy combatant. You, know? <laughs> you, you must be a coward. You must be afraid to say certain things. And you must be afraid to express what you really think and feel. And you must be a great American. <laughs> you know? And that's, that's why you see we're on the verge of something big happening. Because maybe I'm speaking for hundreds of thousands of people. You know, maybe maybe there's other people who feel the same. Hey, you know what? I'm not going to take this sitting down. I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to be quiet. I'm not going to. I'm not going to live my life ducking and cowering from, from every little freaking little trick that they come up with in their book. You know, every little thing they're going to try to flick at you. And pin to your back of your shirt, you know. Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I'm an encouragement to some people. I don't know how. Do, do, am I so shadow banned that nobody sees my videos anywhere? I'm just talking to the CIA and the FBI and the and the NSA and the other freaky creep idiots that are working for the um, mystery Babylon that are working for the enemy that are interested in taking away freedom and that's all they consider concerned about is controlling others. Maybe that's the only people I'm talking to, I don't know. I'd like to think that, that you know, there's somebody out there who may say, you know what, this is right, we're not, we're, we're only going to cower and duck until they, until they just bury us alive. Let's have, a, you know, a few of us who are willing to say whatever we want and end up in jail or end up getting, uh, you know, uh, um, our lives taken away because we didn't want to um, become cowards. And, 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 and by the way, that's one of the things that on, on earth is in heaven. One of the things you don't get into heaven if you're a coward. It says that. No cowards. So that's something to think about. You know, you're a Christian. You know, and, and you have this opportunity to say, hey, you know what? Um, I'm not going to go along with this just condemning and destroying people's lives just because they have, you know, feelings and emotions that, that, that um, you know, when they say things that could be, or, you know, they do, you know, they do, do things that, like, you know, somebody wants to call hate. Somebody decides they're going to call it hate. And so you're going to join their, join in on it and, and, and condemn them? Or you're going to say, hey, wait a minute, no. Um... And Jesus, I thought Jesus was the lover of sinners. I thought that, you know, where, where, where what are we going to join in in condemning people? Just because somebody decides they're haters and, that, and we're going to call ourselves Christians and we're followers of Christ and Christ wouldn't do that. You know, think about it. I mean, you want to be, you want to go, you want to go from the cradle to the grave as a coward, ducking and hiding and cringing from because somebody might call you something, a, a word. That's your life. That's going to be your legacy. That's going to be your legacy. Oh, yeah, my, yeah, my legacy. Oh, I always, um, I always, you know, never said anything that, never said anything to some people. Where, you know, people decided that they might 
They might look down at me or condemn me or whatever, you know. So. Wow, you know, I mean, how, how do you, how do you build a society of cowards? You, you know, the, the society's over, the civilization's done. If, you, if you're gonna go be intimidated into this path, where are they gonna lead you? They'll lead you right, you know, they're right, leading us right down a cattle chute. You can't step over here, you can't step over there, you, you know, keep, just look forward and march, you know? <laughs> And um, it's these social Marxists. We know who they are. We know, we know who the people are. You know, it's the social Marxists. We, we, you know, you even know who the people are. We know, their new, we know the newspapers they publish. They publish in the New York Times and every other newspaper. They, you know, they're, they're, they're doing this thing now, for instance, you know, you notice that you, can never, you never see a family with more than two children in a commercial, in an advertisement, in print, you know, um, um, or, or on, on video, anywhere, the, 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 they control all these ad agencies. They say, okay, here's what you're going to do, here's how you're going to do it, you know, they, they control. Um, what was it? The other day I was in a waiting room somewhere, they had men's health. And about every, every tenth page there was an ad for um, some kind of homosexual something, I don't know, health care or something. Gay, you know, everything, every page, every every tenth page was an, another ad for this thing. Was um, it's all the magazines, you know? Okay, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take all the, uh, all the magazines now. All of a sudden, okay, we're gonna do this now. And you know, all the schools, we're gonna teach this now. We're gonna say this now. We're gonna condemn this now. We're gonna do this now. We're gonna, you know, um, now we're gonna go after the Confederate flag, and then we're gonna go after this, and then we're gonna go after that, and then we're gonna go after this, and we're gonna go after that. And you know, and if somebody fights back, they're a hater. <laughs> so I, um, you know, I, I, you know, done this before, and I, I said, you know, I don't care. You, you know, you, you call me a hater, that's okay. You can call me a racist, that's okay. Call me whatever you want. I don't care. I'm not gonna defend myself. I'm not gonna hide. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna dodge. I'm not gonna cower, I'm not going to cringe, I'm not going <laughs> to, but the, probably the best thing, that, you know, the, well, the best thing to do is, 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 is to, um, probably the best thing is say, you know, why are you using this control word? Why are you trying to control me? And why are you, why are you putting this label on me to try to control me? You know, why, why can't you discuss issues like an intelligent person? Why, why can't you have a conversation? Why do you, you know, what, you know, what's, what's going to happen now, you know? Um, where are they going to take this? Where is this going? Where, you know, how crazy is it going to get? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I already see I'm, what I'm saying is I'm getting in line. To, I'm, getting in li I'm getting in line to be executed. I, I want to get, I want to be in front of that line. When it comes time is, hey, you know what? We decided you're a hater. Or where you decided you're a neo-Nazi, or where you decided whatever, I, I'm, I'm be in front of the line to get my head cut off by the government. I, if you put me in the front of the line, I'm already I'm, I signed up first, so you can follow me if you, you know. What I mean, and let's let's get some volunteer. Let's you know we could have a hashtag, you know, hashtag line me up first, because I'm not gonna shut up. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dodge from your weasel words. I'm not gonna hide from your your little condemnation. You know, tags. You know, I, I, you, you're, here. You want to? You want? You want to um, make a case against me? I, you heard? You listened to my video? You saw what I said? I said that we should have been fighting for Hitler, because he he had the right idea. He we, he was trying to wipe out these guys that are now controlling and turning this world into this control freak society of cowards. Maybe you could put me in line for the for for the, you know the death penalty for that saying that. I'm all for it. I'm not going to deny it. Put, go ahead, kill me. I don't care. You know, put me. I'll be in the front of put me in the front of the line. I'm not. I'm not. You know, not. I'm, yeah, but put put me here's a, you can put me in line for this. Okay, I'm saying, you know, let people be racist. It's not the end of the world. Is a little bit of racism isn't, you know, it's not going to hurt anybody. Everybody. Uh, everybody's. Everybody has racism inside. They they think they they think that people are different. They think you know what, you know, 
uh, black people say, you know, I, I'm glad I was born black and not white or whatever. You know, and that's okay. Let him, that's the why. Why are you going to deny him that? If somebody says I'm glad I'm white and not black or whatever, why are you going to deny him that? that something like that. Why? Why do you got to be so ungracious? You could try to destroy him. It's an opportunity for you to control people. You know, try to control me. Let me let me see you try to control me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Try to control me. Let me see what you can do. <laughs> let me see what you can do to control me. This is gonna. I, I, this is your. This is my challenge to the. You know the control freaks out there that, that operate everything that run. You know the little networks of of grapevines that say, okay, look, you. Know, oh look, we found a neo-Nazi. Let's, uh, you know, try to get him fired or whatever. You know, we found a racist. We found, oh, we found a racist. Let's, uh, you know, and they do this to people, you know, and, and, and there are brave, they're brave. This woman, there's a woman, let me look it up. I'm going to look it up. There's, I, I really, there's a woman, a brother and a sister. And they were on, um, they were on Red Ice Radio. Let me look it up here. This, these, these people were so important. I need to honor them on my, okay, let's see. Here. The Red Ice Interviews. A brother and sister from Canada that, that um, got totally um, attacked. Well, one, one of them lives in Germany, and one, the brother's in Germany, and she's in Canada. And she's a violin teacher and an uh, accomplished violinist and playing in the orchestra. And she um, said that she was questioning, you know, the 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 regular Holocaust story, the whole thing about, you know, were these really people just set up to, you know, these camps were set up to eliminate people? I mean, why, why did they go out of the trouble to um, transport people? And, and you know, the, the, the accurate history seems to be saying that, you know, we're talking about, you know, work camps. See, we're, um, there were, there were Germans who, who um, decided to take it upon himself to try to kill um, some of the generals who were trying to kill Jews because um, they didn't want to send them back to to East because they were afraid they were going to just get arms and come back and continue to kill Germans. So that I'm not, I'm not saying you know that, that was a justified thing to do. I'm not just. I mean Hitler was against that actually. If you see the documents, if you if you listen to a good historian like David Irving or somebody like that who's really studied the issues, you know. Um, you will see that um, the idea that, you know, World War II was about Hitler deciding, you know, the Germans decided to kill the Jews is just not, it's just not there. Okay, this must have been 2015. Okay, let me see. All right, so... Yeah, maybe it was, okay, I'll, I'm fine, I'm looking at Red Ice. There's so many good stuff on, on, on Red Ice. If you, the interviews are just spectacular. One after another, he's got, they got hundreds of interviews with really interesting, but now almost none of them are Christians, by the way. And even if you get an occasional Christian, like, um, like maybe they're Catholic, or you get occasional, like, um, David Duke, who's like a cultural Christian, you know? I mean, I, I think that only maybe once they had a Protestant, on. And there was and once they had this they, they once they had this this Christian on who I thought really you know abused and took advantage of of, um, of Henrik Promgen's um, kindness because he just kind of preached right over him and he didn't he didn't he didn't really bother to explain anything or talk you know he just kind of did too much preaching over I you know have conversations so you don't you know so you know, you know, you, you want to have a, an intelligent conversation. You don't need to bulldoze people or anything like that. So maybe that's why. Maybe that's why he's he made him gun shy about having having a Christian Protestant on. But you know, um, I, I would love to be on there. I don't. You know, I mean, that they they usually get you know they get people that have done something besides just YouTube videos. You know, they get these really interesting people. I don't know. I can't find this woman. Where is this? This was her brother and sister. They were Canadian. That's weird. Now I can't find it. She, so what happens is, you know, she was, she's questioning this, and the, the control freaks that like to destroy people's lives, 
you know, decided they, you know, that they, they better destroy her life by, um, you know, outing her as, you know, Holocaust and something. And the thing is, the, the Canadian people are so, they've been so brainwashed all their lives in, you know, thinking, you know, that they better listen to these authorities when they say, you know, here's a bad person. You know. And the Canadian people that loved her just turned their back on her because of this. I mean, what's wrong with, you know, hearing her out and saying, hey, you know, what, what, what does she say? Why does she say? What does he got any real reason? You know, does she say anything? So anyways, now I can't find it. I don't know why I can't find it. Was it? I thought it was 2015 or 2016. So I can't find it too bad. I wanted to really honor this this woman and her brother because they, you know, here's a woman and she's she's taking it. She's taking it um, with a backbone, you know. But it, you know, you got you got to admit that hurts. You know, these people that used to love her as a teacher, she's not that good. She's a great violin teacher. You know, she's really good for her children. She's got, you know, and then they just turn their back on her. It was, it was a terrible thing. Oh, here she. I found her. Okay, here it is. Ritual defamation of Canadian violinists. And German police raided her brother as a thought, thought criminal, right? Okay, so. Okay, Monica Schaefer, a, a national park warden. And I think she, they also kicked her out of national park warden, right? Professional violinist, lifelong environmental activist. She's formerly involved with the Green Party of Canada, was uh, um, a candidate for four elections. Monica has been an active community member in her small town of Jasper, not only as an activist, but also a musician donating her, uh, donating her music on countless occasions. After making a video challenging the official Holocaust narrative, Monica found herself the victim of ritual defamation, a process through which an individual is subject to intense social pressure and stigma stigmatization. <sighs> Alfred Schaefer, a German producer with several YouTube videos aimed at exposing the brainwashing lies and control words that are used to subject entire populations to Zionist agenda. His video, Brainwashing 9-11 and the Holocaust Hoax, outlines how the Jewish Western elite have managed to perpetrate a massive deception through manipulation of the mainstream media and political leaders. Okay, so we begin by giving Monica a chance to explain her journey. While well, she began by looking into 9-11 truth, she would later discover World War II revisionism. Monica was able to overcome her initial apprehension and delve into the subject long enough to realize that the official Holocaust narrative uh, Holocaust <laughs> narrative amounts to a little more than post-war propaganda. This eventually led her to creating a video in which she apologized to her deceased German mother whom many years ago she had chastised for not trying to stop the alleged genocide. Due to challenging the idea that six million Jews died in German extermination camps, Monica quickly found herself victim of ritual defamation. Alfred also shares the story of his house being raided by German police for thought crime. We conclude the first hour of discussing the nature of the um, migrant crisis, groupthink, and how necessary it is to question the official World War II narrative. In the members' hour, we consider the fact that uh, celebrities such as Mel Gibson oftentimes express controversial views only to later recant. This has the effect of intimidating the average person into keeping quiet. We discuss the control words, right? Racist, Nazi, bigot, etc., that prevent people from discussing vital issues. Monica that outlines a few elements of ritual defamation, including the attempt to involve the victim's family in the defamation process. We also discuss the fact that our hostile ruling elite are lecturing us about the alleged Holocaust of Jews when actively engineering our destruction. Alfred concludes the show by imploring us to stop using language of our enemy. Instead of Nazi, we should say human. For this buzzword is nothing more than a form of mind control used to prevent ethnic Europeans from enjoying what all peoples need, self-determination. So that's why you should subscribe to um, Red Ice uh, Red Ice Radio, Red, Red Ice, become a Red Ice member because you got all these excellent interviews. You got, um, you you, know, you don't want to hear the second hour. Often the second hours are even juicier than the first. They, you know, they really get into important stuff. So, you know, this is what uh, there's somebody else I want to talk about. Here's what I here's Red Ice also turned me into this woman. Um, you know. 
who's um, an incredible historian, a young woman too. And she also happens to be um, have a, a degree, like a master's degree in mechanical engineering or something like. Let me see if I can find her. She was really incredibly interesting. I think she was in 2015. Let me see. I think I talked about her before. Um, Veronica. Um, maybe her name will come to me. Uh, here she is. Okay. All right. Is this um, Veronica Clark? Veronica K. Clark. Wow. She's a fire. She's a firecracker boy. Uh, um, she, you know, she's pretty young looking. I mean, I mean, she kind of almost looks like she's maybe still in her twenties. But um, wow. Okay, the Glitzwitz incident, Nazi false flag or media hoax. Okay, so um, she's probably she's really good with with um, uh, she's really good with World War II history. Okay, so so uh, there's two of them here. She has this. Let me find the other one. She does. She's Veronica Clark. Wow, she's a real firecracker. You got it. You got to. You have to. Um, Join, get a membership, to Red Ice, because um, I mean, you know, and I'm a Christian. I'm, 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 you know, you see, you heard my video. You know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a devout fundamentalist, you know, evangelical, and um, there's so many, <laughs> there's, there's so much, you know, like pro-pagan, anti. They're not like they're not anti-Christian in the sense that they. At least not at this point. They really want to do harm to Christians, you know. But they just think that, you know, the, the Red Eyes view is, you know, that Christianity is um, just another man-made myth. You know. And, you know, I, I, you know, I can live that down. I mean, you know, the, 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 the you know, you know, um, I'm, you know, not the kind of person that holds grudges or, you know doesn't like somebody because they don't agree with me you know the 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 these people that they there's so many people they have on this these interviews are just fascinating people incredible interesting people I mean there's like a treasure trove of humanity now let me see maybe she was in 2000 I'm trying to find her other one because she, she wrote this book called black Nazi I really, oh, here she is, okay. Demystifying popular Nazi conspiracies. Okay, this girl, she's something else. Veronica, Veronica K. Clark, specializes in World War II and military history. She has two associate degrees, one of which is diesel mechanics technology. And she completed one year of doctor, doctoral studies in organizational psychology. That's what she, okay, that's what she's, the, the diesel mechanics is also, okay, or, um, organizational psychology. Veronica founded Vera Icona Publishers in 2011. She's originated both the Warwolves of the Iron Cross, Werewolves, and Powerwolf publications series, as well as the author of the popular book Black Nazis. Her next book, Werewolves of the Iron Cross, Black Wolf, White Reich, Volume 2 is scheduled for release. This will be her most comprehensive book on National Socialism, Race Theory, Race Relations to date. She'll address common myths surrounding the National Socialists, such as the Reichstag fire being a German false flag attack, or that Jews funded Nazis, or that Nazis run the U.S. government today. Veronica also addressed the lie of Nazi obsession with racial purity. She speak about Nazi Germany's relationship with minorities and foreigners, including black Nazis. In the members hour, we will continue discussing Nazi myths, such as the claim that fluoride was used in concentration camps. Veronica also details what happened with Poland. She also talked about the false claim of an extermination plan for Slavs or that the Germans viewed them as less. Then we'll hear about Hitler's attempt to find home for the Jews. She'll talk about what she thinks the war was really about. Veronica explains Hitler's relationship with Stalin, communist activities, and the myth of Britain's innocence in the good war. Later, she speaks about why Nazis were against Freemasonry. 
Veronica elaborates on what Freemasonry began as and what it is now. She explains why National Socialism and Fascism are the nemesis of the Jews. At the end, she shares her sources and talks about the challenges with presenting these truths. So that, that's solid gold there. That needs to be, um, you know, listened to with an open mind. And, you know, you can learn quite a deal. Let's see, let me read, I want to read her other one. Let me see if I can find her again on here. Oh, here she is, okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, Veronica Clay Sark specialized in World War II in military history. She earned a bachelor's degree in liberal studies in 2005, a master's degree in military history. In 2009, Veronica founded Vera Icona. So she does all, all these other things. Too. She, um, one of these people, is she's um, too much formal education. I, I, um, I, I can't do formal education. Anyway, publishers in 2011, now called Wilk Mocha, Moki, uh, publishers. Miss Clark is the author of many books. As she returns to the program for a follow-up on her latest volume, The Glitzwitz Incident, Nazi False Flag or Media Hoax. In the first segment, Ron talks about the background of the strained relation between Germany and Poland that began in the 1600s. She tells of the deep wounds of German psyche that were inflicted from the years of conflict over lands and money that set the stage for animosity towards the Poles. She explains the incidents at Glitzwitz where, according to the official narrative, the Nazis posing as Polish staged an attack near Germany's border, which ended up being the pretext for launching off murderous uh, abomination of World War II. We also talk about Britain's meddling and sabotaging in the North that made it impossible for the region to be at peace. In the member segment, Veronica discusses the meddling and sabotaging in the North, uh, oh, sorry, the, um, made it impossible in the North, okay, so, right, so in other words, um, you know, the, the, the various um, Scandinavian countries that didn't want to get involved. The Brits, and you know, the Brits were the, the Brits have been under this um, top of the pyramid control freak thing for hundreds of years. You know, um, I don't, I don't consider the Brits to really have a mind of their own, just like the Americans. They're they're, they're told what to do. Okay. In the member segment, Veronica discusses the. Um, reason uh, behind uh, Hitler's invasion of Poland. She says that he was pursuing an alliance with Poland, but that he did have an imperial intent for unifying Northern Europe in the spirit of authoritarian Germanic rulership in order to create a powerful front against Russia. Uh, Veronica tells us about Hitler's unique vision for the future of Europe and his ultimate selling out of the Eastern European people that was sealed when he enlisted the Nazi Soviet pact. Then we talked about Hitler's views about the cultural superiority of the European race and we compare this to the concept of American exceptionalism and white supremacy. Later Veronica talks about the Zionist anti-Western agenda to supplant power that is putting Confederate symbols in history under attack in America and desecrating the lifeblood of the West. We take a look at what ties the cult of Freemasonry with Judaism, along with the blatant Masonic messages that are constantly entwined with pop culture. At the end, Ms. Clark considers the genetic and biological opponents of a strong leadership and Nordic element in European power. That's some more solid gold there. Okay. So, yeah, anyways, um, that's uh, my plug for um, some of the great interviews that I've, you know, seen or heard and heard, listened to on uh, Red Eyes. So, okay, I think that's my spiel for tonight. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, I'm going to embolden some people. And uh, when, they, um, when they start the line, uh, you can get behind me. I shall run to the front, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 